Uh, welcome everybody out there in Homeland. Um, I'm David Katz Nelson. I'm the CEO of Reboot, and I hope you're all healthy and safe, uh, getting better if you've had a hard time um, settling into this crazy reality that is upon us. I am so excited for today's conversation. Reboot's an organization that at its core looks at reinventing ritual. Uh, we think about reinventing and thinking about Jewish traditions differently, uh, playing with what we've inherited to make sense of our current reality, uh, to make something that we can find um, inspiration from and make our own. And this conversation you're about to enjoy really hits this core of a bigger conversation we've had at Reboot for 19 years. It's a conversation we were hoping to have at our Ideas Festival in March, uh, but since it was canceled, now you get to enjoy it from your homes around the earth. Um, I want to start by saying I'm, I'm reading from The Snow Leopard right now uh, by Peter Matheson with my nephew um, and came upon this part as we were putting this event together. And I think it sets the table nicely. The progress of the sciences toward theories of fundamental unity, cosmic symmetry. How do such di um, theories differ in the end from the unity which Plato called unspeakable and indescribable, the holistic knowledge shared by so many peoples of the earth? The mystical perception is remarkably consistent in all ages and all places, East and West, a point that has not been ignored by modern science. That really hit me. And with that, I would like to introduce to you my dear friend, David Pesovitz. Before I do, just some information. Um, during the talk, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A tab below. That way they'll get to the right people. All right, David. David Peskovitz is a partner and editor at Boing Boing, the seminal technology and culture web magazine with more than 5 million monthly readers, and co-founder of Ozma Records. In, in 2018, David won a Grammy Award for the Voyager Gold Record 40th Anniversary Edition, and it's through this project that he got to know our esteemed guests. David is also, like myself, a problematic record collector, a huge music fan, and someone you can have an amazing conversation with about any topic under the sun. He's one of those friends who makes life more enriching. Uh, and with that, um, I hand it over to my dear friend, David. Buddy, thank you so much. I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am for this opportunity. Um, you know, it's very special to have the opportunity to have the conversation with these two amazing, amazing women that we're going to hear from. Um, you know, for me personally, even if there was nobody else uh, listening, this is a big, big deal for me. Um, so in 1977, NASA launched these two space probes, Voyager 1 and 2, on a grand tour of the solar system and into interstellar space. Um, and attached to each of them is a golden phonograph record. Um, and on this record uh, are uh, uh, musical pieces from many cultures and many eras. There's greetings in 55 languages and one whale language. Um, and there's images encoded as audio, and there's a beautiful sound poem uh, called The Sounds of Earth. And at the end of The Sounds of Earth, there's this curious sound. And if you look into it and, and, and learn about it, it's really um, a recording of brainwaves, of vital signs. And it's the recording of brainwaves of a woman in love. And I can't think of a greater gift from humanity to the cosmos, to any extraterrestrials that might encounter this probe over the next few billion years, than the recording of a mind in love. And that person uh, who was recorded was the creative director of the Voyager record. Um, and uh, her eventual husband was the director of the Voyager record project. And, that person is Annie Drianne, um, a dear friend of mine who I got to know um, over the course of releasing the Voyager record uh, uh, box set. Um, Anne is the executive producer, writer, and director of, of Cosmos, um, the iconic TV show that she and, and Carl Sagan uh, created together and that continues. And there's a, a, a new season and it will also be airing in the fall on Fox, which is a huge deal for many reasons, and, and we'll talk about that. Um, Annie's written many books, um, most recently Cosmos, Possible Worlds, which is a companion book to the, to the series, and she's really spent her whole 
whole life sparking curiosity and, and wonder about the universe and our place in it. Um, and I'm grateful for, for that, for, for enjoying her work and, and its impact it's had on me personally throughout my life. Um, Anne and Carl also made uh, two other things together. <laughs> they, made, they made a son uh, who's in Los Angeles, who's a producer, Sam, and a daughter, Sasha Sagan, who's here with us today. And we have Sasha on the screen. Sasha, can you come on the screen? There you are. Hey, Sasha. Hey, sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. That's okay. That's okay. So, um, Sasha, you wrote the, the, this new book. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, oh, yeah, you can't. Let's see if I can move it. It's kind of being blocked by these cosmic rays. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the new book is called For Small Creatures Such as We, and it's, it's a beautiful, inspiring memoir exploring the intersection of science and spirituality <laughs> in a secular home, in the home that you shared with, with your brother and your parents, um, Andrian and, and Carl Sagan. Um, and like your parents, I think you have the, I'm going to embarrass you, but, but you have this <laughs> passion and wisdom and, and the talent to simultaneously instill a sense of awe, hope, but also skepticism <laughs> through you. the work That's that you so do. Kind. And that, that's, I mean, that's a very, very rare talent when you're talking about, about um, all of those things together at the same time. But I wanted to ask, um, you know, the, the, um, the book title comes from a quote uh, from the novel Contact that eventually became a movie um, that, that your parents wrote. And I'm going to just say the quote. Um, and then I want to ask Anne what that quote means. And then I'm going to ask you why you chose it for the title of your book. So the quote is, for small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. And what does that mean? And I know you're actually the person who wrote that specific passage. David, first of all, thank you for such a lavish and feeling and beautiful introduction. You know how much you guys mean to me. I mean, I, I so deeply appreciate it. What it means is, you know, science has created what I call the great emotions. It has displaced us from our delusions of centrality at the center of everything. And when you think about it, it's as if our civilization has experienced the same stages of development as a single person does. Wow. When you're an infant, you are the center of the universe. And the, the price paid for adulthood, for maturity, is the realization that you're not. And so I, the more that science reveals the true scale of the universe and the reality of our personal tininess in all of it, some people find that very painful. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, and I, you know, if I can recapture what I was thinking when, when, I, when I first thought that line, was that it's a really good thing that we have this transcendent experience because it makes that letting go of our centrality, both personally and cosmically, acceptable and even something very good. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I cherish the vastness, but yeah. equally I cherish the, the experience of loving and being loved. For some people it's painful experiencing that vastness, but for others it's, it's joyful. It's calming yeah. and reassuring and, and, uh, blissful. You know, I have a friend who, who hopefully maybe on this call who emailed me today and said that during this, he steps out and looks at the lake every day and thinks about how vast the universe is. Um, and it, and it calms him, um, in this, in this dark time, Sasha, why did you pick that passage 
out of the, the you know, <laughs> many books uh, that your parents have written with such beautiful passages, why, why did you pick that one? What, what spoke to you about it? It's such a good question. And thank you, David and Francine and everybody, other David at Reboot for doing this and having us here. Um, you know, I think it's like once you go, when you talk about how painful our smallness is and our brevity, and if there is no evidence of anything after this, if it's just a blink of an eye and a little out of the way planet for just a millisecond, and you dive into the experience of the existential crisis, that that, you know, it's really hard to not just have that like heart palpitation when we think about our little world, like the image behind you in this great darkness. Well, then what do we have? What's on the other side of the total emotional freak out, which is totally understandable. It's that we're here right now and we're together for this moment and we, we're not alone. We have each other on this little world. And I think that, that the idea that there is immense beauty and um, uh, reassurance and meaning, not despite science, but through it, because of it, that we can understand mm -hmm. it is really the crux of what I'm interested in. And it just, that single line really uh, crystallized so much of what my parents instilled in me from a very young age. And the idea that what is real uh, is still, um, not still, but it's, it's, it's amazingly beautiful and full of wonder and awe. And it doesn't require something mythological to, for you to feel that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I remember um, it, it's been several years now, but um, when I first, around when I first met um, Anne and started on the, the Voyager record, um, uh, 40th anniversary edition, I happened to just read a piece that you had written for, I think it was O Magazine, um, that resonated with me so much because um, you know, it was about ritual and science and, and religion. And, and um, for me, as someone who is an atheist, but also identifies as Jewish and, and enjoys some of those rituals, um, it really, really struck me. Um, what led you to write to write this book? Well, I think that, you know, when you when you have a scientific philosophical outlook, when that is the way that we get the answers to the deep questions, that's really fulfilling in the philosophical intellectual department for me. But it doesn't have like holidays and, you know, rites of passage and cuisine and expressions and things that you pass on. I guess there are expressions, but it's not like the expressions you use when you like drop something, you know? Um, and like, it's, there are no exclamations, really. And I thought, you know, we have to mark time and grieve and celebrate and do these things, even if we don't subscribe to the theology of our ancestors or our parents for some people, or, you know, even, you know, there are relatives of their generation. And I think finding a way to navigate this and say, we still have to have, you know, weddings and funerals, we still have to have parties when it's dark and cold and do it through a lens that's not religious. What I couldn't get over as I started researching is how underneath the specifics of time and place so often there's a kernel of a real scientific phenomenon, the solstices, the equinoxes, you know, coming of age is a biological event, death, birth, these are all real scientific events that get dressed up differently depending where you are, but we're all really celebrating the same things and they are real so often. And that's what I became really interested in because, you know, I'm like, I like a party. I want to celebrate. I want to do things. I like a big wedding. I like all that stuff, but um, sometimes the infrastructure is religion. And so what do you do if that doesn't speak to you, but you still want to have these important milestones in your life? I want to take a minute and ask um, uh, Anne to give us give us some context. I mean, you know, you you're you're an atheist. Carl's an atheist, um, but you didn't grow up in household. I mean, both of you grew up in Jewish households, right? Um, 
Right. And so yeah. what was that like for you? I mean, you've told me before that your, your, I think your grandparents, I mean, it was a, an Orthodox Jewish background. Yeah, I was very lucky because my father's parents were extremely devout. And at the same time, in their uh, simplicity, and uh, they were poor, uh, they were uneducated, although they were readers, but they only read in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. But in their mm -hmm. devoutness, they were also humane, compassionate, accepting, unbiased. And so I got to see what is the greatest of devotion. And, um, you know, the great legacy. Uh, my, actually, I am... I don't know if I'm an atheist. Oh, okay. I, I, like to, I like to ask. Fair enough. That I fit, that my my position is I know so little. I am so ignorant. I have just been here for a few minutes. I don't even know. I know just a tiny fraction of what people on Earth know, let alone what the whole universe holds. And so my view is. As with Socrates, is he among you knows most who knows nothing? So um, I am going to say that I don't know anything about how the really how the universe came to be. I mean, I could talk to you about the Big Bang, those things, but those are to some extent shorthand for our ignorance. And, and so, so I just, my position is, um, for me, science is the greatest spiritual high, up there with love. And it's very much like love in that it's unflinching. It's not looking to project its, its aspirations, its fantasies, its fears onto another, onto the universe. It's looking to see the other and the universe and love it as it really is. So for me, science is the greatest roadway to get closer, even though I know that the immensity and the vastness is so beyond my can that it's just the most that I can hope to have. So, but I just wanna very quickly um, say that my, my father, was, I, I'm just like him in, in many ways. I, he was one of my best friends and he was someone whose parents were very devout. He never believed. And he was able to tell them that he didn't believe without, without losing their love. They had no problem with that. My grandfather famously said, you know, the only sin would be to pretend. And it's that sin of pretending in love, in science, in life, that is the key. And I think that when I look back on this legacy from my grandfather who was born in Druya, in what is now Belarus, uh, you know, this, this, this man who had no education and who starved on many a day. And I just think that, you know, I ended up philosophically, very much in the same place he did. Very interesting. Did you, did, do you recall, was there a time with, with Carl? I mean, you were both fairly young. You were very young at the time um, of meeting, uh, were you late twenties maybe? I was did, actually, when I met Carl, I was 24. And okay. when we began our life together, I was 27. Okay. And so did you, do you remember having a conversation um, early on about, you know, your views on, you know, religion and, and God and... Oh, of course. It's the most interesting thing. I mean, you know, it, I think we might have even discussed it the first evening that we met at Nora Ephron's apartment, you know, at this dinner party, because uh, it's, it's so endlessly fun to think about, to talk about. Um, and you can learn so much if you're, if you're, if you're open. And, um, but Carl and I, there was no daylight between us philosophically. It was truly uh, just a tremendous unity that we had. And uh, we came from 
a set of parents who were virtually interchangeable. Wow. A dynamic, brilliant mother who uh, was a thwarted genius and uh, kind of Rodney Dangerfield in a way, you know, not getting any respect and very bitter about that, justifiably. And uh, both of our fathers were preternaturally luminous, kind, loving, embracing. And so these, this polarity between our parents, you know, we are the idiom of love. We spoke the same exact idiom of love to begin with. Amazing. And so that was, the, you know, it was, it was divine. And, and look what we made. I just, <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, what was it like? So, so tell me about when, when you were growing up and there were, you know, holidays, whether it was uh, Passover or whether it was, you know, Christmas was going on. What was your experience of those th of those kinds of holidays or of religious experience, you know, the, the religious context? Sure. Well, first, I'd like to say in terms of the question of like, how do you phrase this philosophical mindset? When I'm asked, I always say I'm secular because atheist has a very militant stance and and. I mean, no offense, like, it's fine, but it's just not my personal. Uh, none none you, taken, and I apologize to you no, both no, no, for no. presuming. No, 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 and agnostic has this connotation, maybe unfairly, that you're not interested. And as my mom was saying, like, it's the most interesting thing. It's like you're agnostic very, is like, oh, you pick where we're going to dinner, I'm agnostic, you know what I mean? And so I always say I'm secular because I like the idea of reserving belief without evidence. And so I'm not saying I know, for, you know, to, to find a way to say, I'm not saying I know for sure. I'm fascinated with this. I think about this every day. Um, but like, uh, you know, sort of separating the idea of n not being persuaded by something from saying, I know for sure you're wrong. And so that's, I, it's, that, that's fair because if there was evidence that, it, that there's a God or goddess and I saw it, I would change my mind. I would be converted. Would sure. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But to answer your the question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, just pop on up. Don't be shy. <laughs> um, but um, to, to answer the question you actually asked me, um, you know, I really like, I'm very outgoing and I like social, you know, things and like, you know, this is kind of a hard time to be an extrovert, but through the magic of science and technology, we're all together right now. But I think for Passover staters, which we had in this secular way, which is really easy to do, yes. where it becomes about, and this is a tradition I carry on now um, in my own family, but it becomes about the idea that we were enslaved. That was really bad. We are okay now, some of us, many of us, and we must now look to other people who are disenfranchised and enslaved literally metaphorically, um, you know, by all the oppression and ills and prejudice that befall human beings on earth as a call to action by telling the story, you know, to whatever degree yeah. of accuracy um, of our ancestors. And I think you can find, you know, and then that's just like the basic springtime message that you can find in so many spring rituals which is just wow that was close it was almost looked really bad but we made it and we're okay and that's springtime like for so long survival of the winter was not a given and so to get to that point where things are blossoming and the weather's getting warmer is so innately worthy of celebration and it requires no faith but then you also have the the connection you can feel to your ancestors when you do something that you know I after a few generations back we don't know anyone's name we don't you know three or four generations we don't know what village they came from beyond that we just know that they were Jews and like that's something where like when you you know light a menorah or you know you can say okay i at least know that they were probably doing this if i don't know anything else about the that's, people i came from that's amazing i mean i remember you know when i was probably 18 or so and and you know going from a family that would go to temple on the high holidays and i had a bar mitzvah and um i remember sort of like telling my father in this almost like confrontational teen way that i don't even believe in god why do i need to go to temple and 
I, you know, thinking not that he would be mad at me, but that he would be shocked or disappointed or something. And him saying, you think when I go to, when I go to temple, I'm praying to a God, <laughs> like, as if really, you really think that, you know, he was, and then he said, I, I'm just identifying with my history, literally is what he said. Um, not long after that, he handed me a copy of Demon Haunted World, um, oh. which I, which I still have, but I, you know, um, I think it's interesting to think about that there can be, that, that's what seems somewhat unique to me about Judaism, that it, that you can, that you can have be Jewish and and uh, uh, without having a, a belief in in God that that you know um, as Amichai Lau Levi who sort of reboots Rabbi um, you know and runs it what he calls a God optional synagogue a God optional congregation that you know being Jewish isn't what you believe it's what you do um, and you know to me that that kind of resonates. That kind of resonates as well. I mean, I always feel like the thing that stands out is like when you take a DNA test, like it comes back, like mine says like I'm 99.9% .9 Ashkenazi, which like doesn't happen if you're like Presbyterian or something. But I also think so many people celebrate, for example, Christmas in a secular way because yeah. they like the ritual. They want to feel connected to their ancestors. It's totally. meaningful to them when it's dark and cold. How can you not want to make things light and bright and cheerful? And I think that there are more and more um, relationships to holidays and rituals like that than maybe meet the eye. I think you're right. What is, um, um, one more question for you, Sasha, and then I have one for you, Anne, but Sa Sasha, when, what is an upcoming ritual? I mean, the, the book, if you want to explain a little bit, the subtitle is Rituals for Finding Meaning in Our Unlikely World. And you, and you talked a little bit about that, that you created or sort of identified <laughs> existing rituals that that work for you and your family what's one that's coming well i think you know it's one of those things where it's like it's really hard to start from scratch like it's really hard to build something from nothing so you have to kind of like you know like take this something ancient and i think all holidays and rituals that people are celebrating in 2020 are built atop the ruins of things that people were doing you know thousands of years ago and pre monotheistic rituals and all sorts of things um that are you know connected to very ancient things but i mean one ritual that's sort of i mean in a way very ancient but in a way new is in this weird time that we are all in right now you know we live in the center of a small city and we are we have almost three-year-old and we are used to taking her to like the aquarium and to like playgrounds and things like that and that of course is not an option right now so we found a you know small national park that's not far away that's the you know facilities are closed but the trails are open and we wear our mask and and go every weekend and my daughter said you know when things go back to normal can we still go to the forest and I suddenly realized, A, I had been depriving her of this experience that we wouldn't have probably done if not for this total break don't, don't in the involved. normal thing. But now it is a weekly ritual and we all three of us look forward to it every week and we just go walk in the woods. And it's something that we've, you know, been doing since before we were human beings. And it's so deep and profound. And the, but the ritualization of it, of being like, okay, we're going to do this once a week and, you know, is so powerful and we look forward to it and it gives us a rhythm right now when every day feels like it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, you talk about, I, I want to shift the conversation a little bit um, now, we're, you know, but you were talking about, about the, the, the situation we're in right now. And um, I... I had a, uh, I was part of a similar event like this with, with the New York Times columnist Tom Friedman last week. And he said something that really struck me is he, he said, you know, we, it's obvious, but the way he said it was great was that it was about that, that, you know, we're, we're dealing with, with mother nature right now with, you know, um, and as a metaphor and uh, mother, Na you, you can only respond to mother nature with uh, science, with biology, physics, and chemistry, you know, um, you know, you can do as many stimulus packages or, or, you know, business deals as you want, but mother nature doesn't care about any of that. Um, so, you know, and right now we need science more than ever. Um, 
but we're in a really strange situation, um, especially in this country with our relationship to the science that we so desperately need. How do you grapple with that? Well, that was really the inspiration for this third season of Cosmos, was the idea that, you know, as we said in the second season of Cosmos, uh, nature will not be deceived. You know, we can deceive each other and we do constantly. But the beautiful thing about reality and about nature and about science's methodology for for beginning to apprehend aspects of nature is that it's so completely reality-based. Mm -hmm. And so salesmanship and BS are meaningless. You know, I always think of the, you know, like the most earth-shaking revolutionary ideas in the history of science. You'll see that the, the title on the scientific paper announcing these results is always the most restrained. No <laughs> hyperbole, no adjectives, no, you know, it's just really to the point. That's, that's what we need now is an unvarnished truth and not to be confirmed in our delusions, which is, so in doing this new season of, of Cosmos, you know, I was thinking, well, we can't just be telling everyone we're all going to die. We're going to hell in a handbasket, you know, because that doesn't really motivate us. Right. But, you know, to me, science is such a source of hope. And not only science, but all the generations of searchers who have contributed to our current picture, our, our current understanding of nature, their resourcefulness, their willingness to stand up to see it matters what's true, even in the face of, of some of the most brutal repression mm -hmm. and, and, and wanton cruelty. To say, you know, you can kill me, you can burn me at the stake, which is what one of our heroes said, uh, but you can't make me lie about science. Well, if ever the human species needed uh, uh, a moment to stop what we were doing and to take in the enormity of not only this pandemic, but the long shadow over our future, which is climate change. And isn't it amazing that, you know, for 70 years, the scientists, completely correct, warned us what was coming. They predicted the global mean temperature down to fractions of a degree out 50 and 60 and 70 years out into the future. That is prophecy. Talk about, you know, uh, superpowers. That is prophecy. They nailed it, but no one listened. And it wasn't until this moment when we fear for our loved ones, we fear for ourselves, that we've stopped what we've been doing. But what a great lesson for us all, that we can stop what we're doing. We can change the way we live. And, you know, if you won't do it for this magnificent planet and all the life that it supports, maybe there's one kid you love, one child you care about, who's gonna have to inhabit that future that you are making step by step. So, so yeah, so I guess science is, uh, you know, patently, obviously, un unavoidably, our only way out of this pandemic. We all know that. And I think we all know too, that we have to change the way we live. And so, um, you know, in thinking about uh, Passover and what it means to me. It's always been my most favorite holiday. Mine too. And um, oh, my grandmother's satyrs were just, to me, they were the greatest. And Carl and I had on our to-do list to write a new Haggadah. Oh, 
And uh, we talked about it for years and tragically, we never got to write that Haggadah. But if I was writing one, I would, I would keep the fair kashas, the four questions, but I wouldn't give the answers. I would want to hear what the youngest one, what answer they're giving, what new answers we can find in that great tradition. Wow, that's amazing. You know, um, your your comments there just sparked so much in me. But um, I, I was on a I was talking with a, a psychologist who studies, uh, among other things, hope and optimism um, recently, and and she was saying that um, the opposite. You know, a lot of people are seeking, searching for optimism and reasons to be optimistic right now. And she was saying that the opposite of hopelessness is helpfulness. That Helpful. people want that people want to feel that they're able to do some, help themselves, help their families, communities, neighbors, um, the world in some way. And, you know, clearly that, that a lot of that has to do with, you know, there's kind acts, but a lot of it also has to do with embracing the scientific realities um, of the, of the current situation. But yet, um, you know, we're in a situation where, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, anti-science, pseudoscience um, sentiment, um, mistrust of science um, in this country, particularly. Yeah, it's, yeah, and um, and I, it's it's partly because the founding myth of our civilization is what do we, you know, I, I, here we are born in this maximum security prison where we're being watched, surveilled day and night. We don't have a childhood. What is a mammal? What is a human without a childhood? Wake up in this prison and we're being spied on constantly. And what is our sin, our original sin? What did we do that was so bad? We partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. As if, as if that is poison. It's amazing. Yeah, that's right. The original sin in the Bible that so many people believe in and live their try to live their life by is is seeking knowledge. I mean that's <laughs> exactly. Unreal. And so and so the idea is, you know, if God wanted you to fly or know anything or do anything, you you would have been made that way by God. But this God is is the parent who can never be satisfied, who hates us for our human self because we are human. That is what a pernicious, wicked idea. I love what Diderot said. He said, um, the problem with Western civilization is that our God loved his apples more than his children. <laughs> I hear, I hear oh, David. Oh, boy. Awesome. Yeah. David what, yeah, any thoughts, David, on that one? <laughs> <laughs> hey, for some reason I lost you guys. I I, I don't. There? We I see you. Sasha. Hi. There you go. Beautiful. There. You're back. Um, <laughs> Sasha, are you optimistic right now in this dark time that we're in? Well, I think it's another case of withholding belief without evidence. I just I we're not good at predicting the future, and I see very positive outcomes. I see very bleak outcomes, you know, that are, that are possibilities. And I think that, you know, so much of, of what you were just saying about the way that we're brought up and what our values are, I think the value of questioning and asking questions and like the idea that it's, that there are not questions that are off limits or that are stupid, you know, and that deep philosophical, um, question what, um, that deep you know philosophical questions are welcome I think that that's the way we get and, and teaching children that from early childhood which I was very lucky <laughs> to get a lot of encouragement yeah, about asking that on to, to your daughter too thank right? you yeah. I hope to but I think that you know this idea of like if we were able to raise a generation of children where anything is okay to ask. And, you know, obviously some things you might say, like, well, I'll talk about that when you're older, but that by and large, you know, our relationship with 
questioning authority, questioning ourselves is enthusiastic and positive, I think that that is a pathway to a really um, much more, more positive future. Also, you know, paying teachers a lot of money, I think would also <laughs> be a good start. Right. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And same question for you. Are you, you know, you're, you're at home isolating right now. Um, you know, you're, you're following what's going on. Are you optimistic? Well, I was born that way. <laughs> you know? I, I was absolutely born that way. I, I have, I am optimistic. I, 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 I really respect what Sasha said. And I think what Sasha said is absolutely correct. Um, I, but I think that uh, it's also, there's a certain amount of nature besides nurture. And so it's my tendency to try to, you know, always find what could possibly be good about this situation. Mm -hmm. Like, what can it teach us? How can we change? Oh, yeah. And um, so I have hope. I have hope because I, you know, the more I read about uh, the history of our of our species is that we've had our backs to the wall time and time again. That's the nature of life. Life cannot be made safe to some extent. It's risky. And it's, it tells me that we're all only here. I may have gotten this from your book, Sasha, but <laughs> we're all only here because because of the struggles and the triumph of, of, of not just people, but other life forms uh, that are because of our ancestors in any, you know, of any species who struggled and endured. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Also, uh, I think this gives me hope that we're communicating with each other, with Brazil, with people all over the world. It's amazing, I was looking at the, I mean, there's yes. people from, you, yes. know, you saw the people who are here from, exactly. I mean, it's really a global experience. I'm so grateful, I can't. It makes me Thank so you. happy because we're in the process of becoming an intercommunicating organism. And there will be a moment, I believe, of critical mass. Where, because I think most of us are good, and I think most of us want the best for our families and for each other. And so there will be a moment, I believe, of critical mass where the, the decentralized communication of people all over the world will bring us to our senses. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Um, so there was an announcement uh, that came out yesterday, and it was really exciting that, um, uh, well, the new season, first of all, the new season of Cosmos, which which just premiered when, about a month and a half ago, two months yeah. ago, yeah. which um, was perfectly timed, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, just what we need, just what we needed. Um, and it's on what, it's on National, Ge National Geographic. It's on National Geographic in February starting in February or, no, starting in March, sorry. March, right? And now it's going to be on Fox, September 22nd, eight o'clock. prime it's time. A great time for our families to watch it together. And um, and uh, it's Tuesday nights, eight o'clock. I mean, that's per it's perfect but on so many levels. The fact that it's on Fox is amazing. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's just going to be on super mainstream uh tv That's the um, idea. you know you're 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 breaking through you're you, you know it's not preaching to the choir well that's the whole idea i mean going back you know almost 40 years uh carl and i used to write for parade magazine yes a supplement in newspapers on sunday mornings and uh it got to 70 million people yeah. And, you know, it was like, we didn't want to write for, you know, wonderful publications like Scientific American or because we knew that the people who were reading those publications, they were already on their way. You know, they'd already just, they'd cast their vote 
to, 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 to try to learn what uh, the scientific perspective was. And so uh, I, I am really excited about the Run Hot Fox. Um, last time uh, for season two, uh, it was tremendously successful. And it's not only on Fox here, but it's in 172 countries around the world. So that's tremendously gratifying. You know, it took, I am one of 987 people who worked on this show, who touched this show uh, in many different countries. And so it's tremendously gratifying to me that- Yeah, uh, I mean, the thought, the thought of families gathering around uh, to watch the show is, is pretty amazing. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'm trying to think of what other shows these days do, does a family gather around the set to watch. And perhaps now more than ever, it's the kind of show that we need and families need to watch. Well, and I hope it will spark all kinds of lively conversations and, and debates, arguments. Yeah. 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 And deep questions. And more questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Always more questions. Yeah. Um, there was a question in here that I wanted to ask that came in um, that I thought was interesting. And they were talking about, um, <laughs> it was to Sasha, you know, in, and I, and I want to echo what this person said. They said, your father changed our worldview through his books and through Cosmos. And I've said that to you before, Anne, that, that I think Carl moved culture and your work moved culture. Both of um, them together. together. Right, I mean the two of them together move Absolutely. culture. Yeah, and um, in 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 many different ways. But I mean, Cosmos absolutely did. Um, can you describe Sasha what it felt like? Um, <laughs> so this is the question of the person to live with that person and those people every day to help you understand the world. What was oh, that like? It's such a luxury. <laughs> like, it's such what was it a luxury. like to live with your parents? It, well, it's, I mean, on some level, it's like when you're a child, anything that you experience, you don't have any context. So you don't, it takes a long time to realize that something is really out of the ordinary. And I definitely, you know, there's, you just think whatever you have going on is normal. And so there's some element of that, but it was such a luxury and it was just this, enthusiasm and encouragement for curiosity and like I was saying before to never hear and this is something I've written about and I think about a lot but to never hear like that's just how it is or like because I said so and like my daughter is just entering the why 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 phase now and to just like my vow to myself and her is to never cut it off just keep going and sometimes I'm like she's like not yet three and sometimes I'm saying like because this is a social moray and civilization that we have all agreed on. And I'm like, I don't know if this is, like, am I just talking to myself? But she's very curious and she's interested and she doesn't lose interest when I go down these, like, you know, because we've decided that when we sneeze, we say something to each other, but not when we cough, I don't know, like, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and, to say, and to say, I don't know when you don't know. Um, because I think that's so powerful and my parents were so good about that and they were so thrilled and I think it really comes, you know, as a reflection of confidence too. When you feel confident about your intelligence, then it's easy to say, I don't know. When you feel a little bit ashamed or embarrassed to not know, it's a lot harder. And I've, we've all had moments like that in our lives where we don't want to admit we don't know something. Um, and I think that there's something really powerful about being told when you're a child from an adult who you know is smart and, you know, capable. And in my lucky case of growing up, like just happens to be two of the most intellectual forces in the culture to say, I don't know, that's a great question. Let's go look it up. And I just think that that was such a gift and I knew that that was a gift before I knew that anything else was out of the ordinary um, in this household. But just like, you know, that, that feeling of like having your questions taken seriously is so powerful. And I just keep coming back to that as I raise my, my daughter now. And um, you've done, you've been so prolific um, uh, during your during your life um, before and with and after Carl, um, 
what work is your favorite? You know, something you've done on your own or something you've done, you, you did with Carl? Wow. Uh, well, I have a, a great soft spot in my heart for the Voyager record. So do I. <laughs> well, I, know do. I know you do. And what a beautiful, magnificent 40th anniversary. Oh, you're so kind. Uh, I can't imagine, you know, I can't think of a better way actually to have honored the 40th anniversary. Um, so that means so much to me because, uh, you know, just to think of it is to smile. You know, when people say, um, may, when someone dies, may their memory be a blessing. And, uh, you know, the people in my life who I've loved, who I've lost, um, you know, I smile when I think of them. And it's the same with the Voyager record because uh, it was such a privilege, such an honor, such a total fluke of the kindness of chance, the kindness of, you know, I mean, I, I still can't wrap my head around the fact that you began this wonderful conversation with about those feelings of being so deeply, ecstatically in love live on. That is, you know, so for me, the idea that we were, that we can look back on that record more than 40 years later and say, you know, we honored all of our cultures. We honored, we tried to honor as many of our fellow earthlings, human and non-human, as we could and to speak in as many languages as we could, and to see the, 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 our civilization with Carl's planetary perspective, and with none of that kind of um, narcissism and selfishness. So the Voyager record means so much to me, but also, you know, I've been doing Cosmos for 40 years, and when I think of how many people have told me that they teach science or they study science or they do science because they were first attracted to it. Because of that is, I mean, I'm, I'm, you're just talking to one of the luckiest people who ever lived. That's, that's just the whole point. Well, I just saw that a question came in where someone mentioned, uh, 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 let me see. Uh, a woman in here in the comments mentioned that she was going to study uh, astrophysics um, directly sparked by uh, the work that you, that you and Carl did. So, oh. yeah. and you know, my, my, yes, I mean, I love the Voyager record as much as it's a gift from humanity to the cosmos. It's a gift to humanity. Um, you know, a reminder of what we can achieve, I think when we're at our best and, and uh, you know, it sparks the imagination and for me, it instills a sense of hope. So I want to thank you both so much. Um, coming up next, you know, we have uh, 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 and your your Cosmos is going to be airing again in September on Fox, but you can also watch it on on uh, National Geographic right now. No, you can't. No, no, no longer on National Geographic. No, don't do that. You can't do that. Okay, you can't. You can watch it on Fox uh, coming up in the fall, and um, yeah. I encourage everyone to watch it with your loved ones. Um, Sasha, what's next? What's next for you? I know the book has just come out, so you're probably still uh, uh, reveling in the afterglow with that. I thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know what's next. I I I'll just tell you what I think I want to do. We'll see if it ever happens. But I I'd really like to write a children's book. I know we've been talking so much okay. about um, little kids tonight, and I I think that would be a good good thing to try to do. So we'll see. Perfect. Thank you both so much on behalf of, of Reboot and um, also from me. Um, thank you. Your work uh, and your whole family um, inspire me and I'm grateful that we've become friends. So thank you. Thank I'm you, so David. Grateful. Thank you so much, David. I love you, Sashi. Bye, Mommy. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Be safe. Well, I want to thank uh, Anne, Sasha, and David for this truly historic and present and future-looking conversation. I, I want to apologize for, uh, for for laughing in the middle of it. I was 
just smiling ear to ear the entire time and enthralled. And I, I, didn't, I thought I was on mute. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, and for more information on this conversation and other conversations, please uh, go to rebooters.net, which is in your chat. Um, our next big event is on May 28th. Uh, it's called Dawn. It'll also be online. It will be a multimedia extravaganza all night long celebrating Shavuos. We're going to ask the big question, uh, what commandments uh, should we be following in this time that we're in? Anyway, um, thank you all for being a part of this. Um, and, uh, and again, David and Sasha, thank you so much for your wisdom today. It's uh, happening during a time when we all could use it. So thank you and, uh, and goodbye.